Good afternoon, Bermuda, and the rest of the world that's tuning in via the internet. Welcome to Burn News today on the eve of our cup match, Emancipation and Mary Prince holiday. Today we have a very special panel discussion about our national hero, Miss Mary Prince. And joining us today in order of importance is Minister of Community and Cultural Affairs, Honorable Levita Fogo. You can see her there with her St. George's flag with some other thing getting in the way. And there's Miss Rashida <laughs> Godwin. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, St. Georgian. I forgot. Minister Fogo what? is a Minister Fogo is a native Georgian. And there's Hail Rashida Fogo, who has St. George's blood, but for some reason, who Miss Miss Godwin has St. George's blood, but for some reason it's just I don't know, whatever. <laughs> And then yes. we have our brother, author, historian, activist, evolutionary, Ajale, Ajala, who is for? Enjoy this, the East where the wise men rest. Come on now. <laughs> okay, so it's three to one. So we're even. Mm -hmm. So today we're gonna um, speak briefly about our our national hero, Miss Mary Prince. Um, as, as you recently know, I will leave it for the minister to speak about, but as you recently know that we have now changed the second day of cop match, Emancipation Weekend, to name of Mary Prince, a rightful name for, that, for this occasion. So I will just read something briefly and then I'll turn it over to our panelists. Mary Prince, Median slave, enslaved Bermudian, who was born in Devonshire, 1788. The area is called Brackish Pond, which is also Devonshire Marsh. She was born, her parents were both enslaved. Her father was owned by Francis and David Trimmingham. Does the word name Trimmingham mean anything to anybody? Yes. Yeah. And the panelists, trimming him, that doesn't know that name, right? Yeah, actually my um right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, I can share what oh, yeah. yeah, my um my my great great recognize. Yeah, my great great grandmother who just okay. passed away is 103 years old. Her maiden name was um mean. And um, so one of my aunts uh -huh. had traits that it's quite possibly that uh, we might have came from the Trimmingham as enslaved people as well, too, because when the Trimminghams, uh, the enslaved people were made free from them, they didn't allow them to take the Trimmingham name and they split the name between the Mings and the Ings. The Ming, um, I think it was the, the Trims, Mings. The Mings and, and the Ings. Ings. Yeah. Well, I understand, too, if I, right. if I can jump in. It's important to understand that when we talk about, you know, Bermuda, it's, you know, this happens quite often. Um, you will hear, you know, the black deals and the white deals. What we're mm -hmm. talking about is a culture of rape, of breaking into the bodies of enslaved black women. That is how we got the names Trim and Ming and Ingham, or Dill or Smith or Birchall. Yeah? What we're talking about is hundreds of years of of the breaking and entering into the bodies of black women and the defilement of said bodies and the production of, of human beings from that original sin of, of sexual defilement. All right. So when when Mary Prince was 12 years old, she was sold. Guess get 12 year old, imagine a 12 year old being sold off from her mother. Mm -hmm. And she go to Captain John to sail from the Trimminghams to the Inghams. Yeah, to the Ingham. And his wife, Mary Ingham, who, yeah. who lived in Spanish Point. So she, she was sail from Devonshire to this point. So at this point now, I'm going to turn it over to uh, uh, Ajala mm -hmm. and tell us who Mary Prince, who's also writing a book, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. about Mary Prince. Yep. 
tell us in your words uh, who Mary Prince truly was. Yeah, um, a couple of things. Uh, we have to correct some information, some misinformation that's been bandied about as fact. Um, and, and this is key. Um, history is contested ground, all right? So there are those among us who would claim to be historians and scholars of, of, of note, people like uh, William Zuhl or people like James E. Smith or uh, Professor Virginia Bernhardt um, who have systematically and deliberately, I would say, misrepresented our story. But I'll, I'll get to that more uh, later on, hopefully, the free flowing discussion that we intend to have. Now, she was actually born in 1785, not 1788. And her mother's name wasn't Susanna, but was actually Sue. Um, we know this because of the groundbreaking research of independent researcher uh, Leonie Junos, who presented her paper, I think it was called, My Name, Her Name is Sue, uh, yeah. at Oxford uh, in 2019, I believe it was, or maybe it was 2018, I think it was 2019. So yeah. her work- I think um, it was 18, 2018. Yeah. I think it was 2018 as well. So her work is key and critical to um, really presenting the information about sharing the story of Mary Prince um, accurately, and it's important. Tell the story properly or not at all. And some of the people who, put, who claim to be historians have grievously misrepresented the story. So she was born in Brackish Pond, Devonshire, as you said, in 1785. Her parents, Prince and um, Sue, were born into slavery, as was Mary. And she was sold um, three months after uh, Mrs. Williams, who was um, the, I guess, the second owners of of um, Mary Prince and her mother Sue, uh, three months after um, Mrs. Williams died, she was uh, sold in 1798 and sold for the handsome sum of uh, about 57 pounds sterling, right? Which was quite a hefty piece of change. Why? Because she was breed worthy. There was money to be made from uh, breeding a, a girl child. You know, you have many more years of, of uh, productivity from her and hopefully children that she would beget, right? So it makes sense that you buy them young, you rape them up into adulthood, and then, you know, you can... African people at that time were self-generating saleable items, right? So I, I think it's important that we actually understand what was going on there with the sale of Mary as well as... Uh, several of her sisters, Hannah and Dinah, um, three months after Mrs. Williams died in, uh, in April 98. So she was sold to the Inghams, uh, Mary and uh, I believe his name is Captain John Ingham. Mm -hmm. And they lived in Spanish Point. Across, the, the house now stands across from Western Stars Sports Club. And it was there that Mary Prince witnessed um, Captain Ingham beating to death a pregnant enslaved woman, beat her to death, right? And in fact, he would have beaten her to death were it not for the providential in intervention of an earthquake. So when we consider the argument that has been bandied about by, again, uh, white folk who call themselves historians and chroniclers of the story of this island, um, we, we really only need to turn to the pages of Mary Prince's own text in her own words and read of the horrors that she witnessed and that she endured. Right? Um, so she was eventually sold in 1802 to um, another family, um, Mr. Darrell and his equally psychopathic son, Dickie, who then took her to the salt plantations in Parks Island. And I say plantations because well, prior to the uh, invention of refrigeration was incredibly important. It kept meat from spoiling and things of that nature. So you needed a lot of salt, especially in the, in the markets of the time in order to keep your produce fresh. Well, Mary Prince and others down in Turks Island were in charge of raking the salt flats. This was backbreaking work. And quite often she would be uh, knee high in bronze for hours at a time, right? From can't see in the morning to can't see at night, right? To 
this is what she had to endure for a decade. She did this for a decade. And again, um, she witnessed uh, Master Dickey, the son of, of Mr. Darrell, beat a, an infirm elderly woman to death. Right? He picked her up, threw her into a, a briar patch, and she, she succumbed, unsurprisingly, to her wounds. Now, she also witnessed um, others, other workers, other black enslaved workers, with wounds that went all the way to the bone. All the way to the bone, right? We saw it eaten through the flesh. And she speaks of sleeping in corrals the way livestock would. And again, she's not that old. She was born in 1785. She went down to uh, Turks Island when she was 16, 17. Yeah. And spent 10 years there. 10 years of, again, back late breaking labor. Now, again, historian, folk who call themselves historian make the argument that Bermuda had no plantations. And so slavery is somehow less, less burdensome than in other, uh, other locales to the south of us, places like Jamaica and so on. Well, I would beg to differ because what many of the enslaved Bermudians who were taken to Turks Island to work on the salt flats, which for my money are nothing more than salt plantations. Again, you're, accum you're, you're raking salt, which is a product for commercial ventures. And that's what happens on plantations. You harvest a, a, a mass produced product for commercial gain, right? So very much what has happened in Turks Island has to be understood as part of uh, Bermuda's um, remote plantation economy, right? With salt being the commercial product rather than say cotton, right? So I think it, it's helpful to, to frame it as such. We, we definitely did have, I would, I would submit, we definitely did have something akin to a plantation economy in mm -hmm. Turks Island not necessarily in the island of Bermuda. Well, she spent 10 years there and was eventually sold to the woods. Again, these are all sociopaths, you know? And what she experienced, she, by her own words, what she experienced was nothing unusual, nothing particularly shocking in how enslaved Africans in Bermuda were treated. Right? She was simply telling her story as illustrative of the stories of many, many thousands in Bermuda at the time who endured what she went through as well as other nameless atrocities. Right? Mary Prince's story is not exceptional. It is more par for the court. Right? So again, um, disabusing us of the notion that there was any kinder, gentler form of hell that was to be experienced by our forebears in bondage, right? It was terrible for us here too, just as it was terrible for, for Africans in Jamaica or Africans in San Domingue or Africans in Antigua and so on and so forth. Well, she spent <coughs> time with the woods there who took her from Bermuda to Antigua, where again, she spoke of really, again, things that are well nigh unimaginable for us here in 2020. But watching um, slave drivers, enslaved Africans who are forced to uh, carry out physical discipline against their own loved ones, sometimes their wives and children. Right? And the psychological fallout that comes to bear on a man or a woman who has to do that, who is forced to do that. Right? So we're talking about psychic woundedness. Right? Of, the, of gargantuan proportions. I couldn't imagine doing that, beating my child, beating my son, beating my daughter, beating my wife. But again, she witnessed this um, while she was in Antigua. From Antigua, the woods took her to um, the UK, to England, I'm sorry, in 1828. Of course, um, by that time, um, as a result of the Somerset case, um, slavery had been um, outlawed in the British Isles since 1772. Um, so as soon as she touched down in England, she was essentially free. Of course, that's with scare quotes, right? Um, because even when we received emancipation, uh, freedom was still a long time coming. And perhaps we could argue that um, it still is uh, 
some precious fruit that we have yet to uh, taste, even here in 2020. But that's part of from maybe another conversation. Um, so she, after being threatened repeatedly um, right. by uh, Mrs. Wood in particular, who was her husband's um, equal in terms of being a sociopath, really using any means of, of psychic and physical torment um, that she visited uh, with metronomic real, uh, regularity on Mary Prince, right? Really just going at this enslaved black woman who by this time, as a result of her trials in, in Turk Island was nearly blind, was, was very crippled, had been physically um, torn down as a result of being uh, enslaved. Right? So she's maybe in her 40s at this time. We, we crunch the numbers and do the math. We're talking about somebody who's, again, uh, I think Rashida, she's about your age at this time or a few years yeah. old. Yeah. Yeah. So, again, not, not an old woman by any means, but she has suffered greatly at the hands of her enslaved rapists. Well, she has suffered greatly. This is true, can't be denied, but she was never broken. She was never broken. and as a result of, of one vile depredation too many by Mrs. Wood, she took the opportunity to leave. Ms. Mrs. Wood said, well, if you don't like it here, you can get out. And Mary duly obliged. She said, you know what? I'm leaving. And she left. She made it to the uh, doorstep of the anti-slavery society um, where she put the idea to Thomas Pringle, who's the editor, um, that her story could be used as a weapon in the um, struggle for emancipation. So again, this is important. She, it was her idea. She approached Thomas Pringle to tell her story, to use her story as a tool for uh, freeing Africans, not just herself, but all of those who were, were under the pall of bondage in the British colony, right? So she, she was, again, forward thinking and thinking broadly as well. So she approached Thomas Pringle. He said, yes, it would be a good idea. And they started to um, write her story. Susanna Moody, in fact, was the person who was charged with writing the story down. The text was uh, completed in 1831, and it became known as the history of Mary Prince, a West Indian slave as related by herself. And in 19, 1831 alone, it went through three printings, sold out every time. Um, British readers were aghast at the sort of, you know, just the, the casual banality of violence that characterized um, Mary Prince's experience of slavery in Bermuda, in Turks Island, and in Antigua as well. And so they were duly, you know, as one would expect, duly outraged as a result of what was shared in the text. Now, interestingly enough, and perhaps unsurprisingly, um, the anti-abolition anti bloc here in Bermuda was very strong. It raised a great human cry and called Mary Prince all manner of names. So if, if you will, I will just share what, um, what was said about Mary Prince by none other than uh, the World Gazette. So if, if I may, I'll just read, a, read an excerpt. And this is taken from my book. Yeah, entitled, we'll, we'll um, read that and then. Pardon me? So I was saying, go ahead, read that, and then we'll go to the minister. Okay, okay. So this is um, taken from my book, A Tale of Two Women, Sally Bassett, Mary Prince, and the True Story of Slavery in Bermuda. Okay. But not all celebrated the release of the history. Mary and her anti slavery society allies faced fierce opposition from the pro-slavery lobby, both in England and throughout the Caribbean colonies. Not surprisingly, the enslavers and their supporters raised a great hue and cry about what they maintained were little more than the scandalous fictions of a bitter and vengeful servant. The anti-abolitionist bloc in Bermuda had a vocal champion in the Royal Gazette, whose writers gleefully weighed in on the firestorm ignited by the histories. In an article entitled The Anti-Slavery Society and the West India Colonists, dated November 22nd, 1831, the, world, the Gazette solemnly stated that Mr. Wood was, quote, a man of universally acknowledged high character. Mrs. Wood was described in similarly glowing terms 
as quote, a lady of very mild and amiable manners, emphasis there, who was quote, more of a parent than a mistress to those slave Africans fortunate enough to become her property. Asserting that they were guided solely by the dictates of common justice, the Gazette launched, launched into a systematic assault on Mary Prince, Thomas Pringle, and the Anti-Slavery Society. They drew their proofs about the falsity of the history from, quote, the most incontrovertible testimony of the highest respectability in England and the West Indies. Somewhat predictably, and I'll just jump to this ending, somewhat predictably, the Gazette determined that the two enslavers were the aggrieved party rather than the crippled, scarred, and visually impaired black woman over whom they, ex they exercised near total control. In their estimation, the woods were the unfortunate targets of vile exaggerations and unfounded accusations made by Pringle and Prince, whom they referred to as a free woman living in London, emphasis there. They denounced Prince as a prostitute who was given to her moral habits. Furthermore, they concluded that any recollections provided by one of such clearly questionable integrity should not be trusted as they might severely damage the reputations of such demonstrably good people as Mr. and Mrs. Wood. So again, we look and see that the Gazette has consistently been on the wrong side of history for some time now. Again, um, speaking of, of Mary Prince as a common prostitute, right? And singing the praises of her enslaver rapists, again, on the wrong side of history, and consistently so if we look at the historical record over the past 150 years. All right, thank, thank you, Ajala. Um, Minister Fergo, with us yes. now knowing the full story of Mary Prince, what has this government, and in particular your ministry, done to elevate us, commemorate who, who she truly was, not just to Bermuda, but to pe Black people around the world? Okay, I, I didn't catch that last word, but I, I you're finished speaking. So I want to say thanks for allowing me to come on um, and appear on Brand News Live. And I want to say that under this current government, it has been my honor to help lead the charge in recognizing our local heroine. Mary Prince, and indeed a heroine to all of the British Commonwealth, Caribbean, and to others uh, for being a, the key figure, the iconic figure of the abolition of slavery. In fact, as um, Ajala has spoken about in quite depth, um, her narrative, her firsthand narrative that she shared um, has indeed led to those who were in the abolitionist movement pushing forward to win, I guess, if you will, to win outright um, in terms of ending slavery and in 1833 having that enacted. And so in Bermuda, we then enjoyed in 1834, uh, slavery in the and we, even though with all of that history behind us, we know that there are many who have been born and bred in Bermuda who still are not aware, and I call it the real history or the true history. And unless history is told as it would, then, then we're not really hearing the history. So I would understand why Ajala would suggest that persons did not give an accurate and true narrative of um, what it was like to be an enslaved here in Bermuda and period, what it was like um, for black people living here in Bermuda during a slavery um, period. And indeed, Bring up, let's fast forward to modern day and looking at 
some of the names behind yes we see that you have previously had what was known as summer's day and oh, there are yeah. some who suggest that summers of uh, that summers arrive on july um trade. and um you will have the plaque down at gate um beach which is fort st catherine that um, marks him, marks where he arrived on July 29th. And then there are other narratives that speak to July 29th. I subscribe to the July 29th day. And I'll, I'll, I'll declare why, because it's an easier date for me to remember since my daughter was born on that day, one of my daughters. And, um, and, and it gives, sheds light to why they named, I guess, the second day of, Cop match, summer's day, because cop match typically falls on two days, uh, and it usually spans from the 28th to, to the second day of August. So any Thursday or Friday, any of those days from the 28th, I believe it is, to the second day of um, August can be a cop match Thursday or Friday. And hence you had the second day of cop match being known as Summer's Day to commemorate when he arrived here in Bermuda. However, if one appreciates the history of the cop match story and why in fact we even have cop match and you could talk to all of those involved with the Friendly Society um, who are responsible for the, the, the match as we see it today, then one would appreciate why it was so important to rename the second day of cut match after our hero. And it was important for Bermuda to recognize her as a national hero for us because we see many of uh, many other Caribbean islands trying to also give recognition to Mary Prince and understand so. But it's important. She was born here. She is a daughter of our soil, and it's important to pay tribute to her because of the freedoms that I call us all offspring of her, the freedoms that her all enjoy because she dared to get away. She dared to tell her story, and in spite of them trying to shut down her story more than once, that story prevailed, and in so doing, has changed the world as we know it today. And today, on the second of Cop Match, we will further celebrate her legacy henceforth on Mary Prince Day. And further to that, it was important to find a location where we could pay tribute to her. Now, it may not be right next to her birth ground, but it is still in the parish of Devonshire. And the reason why Mary Prince Emancipation Park is located where it is are two main reasons. We know that through all of her trial and tribulation, she longed she longed to escape it. And um, I guess she thought that traveling to the South might bring her a better life. Emancipation Park, the shoreline of Emancipation Park faces South towards the Caribbean. And um, we envision a monument in her honor being there facing in that direction because that spoke to hope for a different life. And still being in Devonshire, there are historians who will speak to the entirety of her, and, and some may argue against it, as being known as Brackish Pond, still being hot and entrenched in Devonshire and in a locale where you had many families who engaged in slavery, we thought it fitting that Tampa Monument and with her spirit, it spoke to her rebel spirit and the fact that um, 
she saw a better life somewhere else, though she may never have truly experienced it. And it is a serene place and the park is still very tranquil and calm. And it is a site where we hope people can go there and be inspired and be motivated to follow Mary Prince's footsteps and, and engage in behaviors that would seek to further advance the democracy within these island shores. And I invite everybody to go down there because I think once being there under the new name and title, you immediately get an appreciation for why it was a fitting tribute for our local hero to be somewhere. There are some who um, uh, thought that perhaps we should have it on grounds such as where the House of Parliament is, other grounds um, that um, speak to um, big government monuments, so to speak. There are those who believe that um, looking at sites like that are from the relics of the that Mary Prince tried to and that in paying proper and fair tribute to her, a location that do, did not have relics that are reminiscent of what that past was like, but being in a location where she, we hear her saying, no, no more, I will not be a part of that. I will stand here free and be the symbol of hope, the symbol of democracy, the symbol of equality. And always standing in defiance of those who would seek to oppress, suppress, and um, enslave. And so hence the, the, the committee, the Emancipation Committee that was put together came up with a few sites. And after visiting all of the sites, that site was seen as the one that paid more heat to who she, what she stood for, and hopefully is a place to inspire those who will follow in her footsteps. And um, hence the emancipation, the Mary Prince Emancipation Park. And um, I have to say at this point, Chris, I want to thank the Rashidas. I want to thank the Ajalas. I want to thank all of the people, and especially those people who we have been involved with here at Community and Culture, who dare to uncover history and bring the real history of um, all people who are um, here in Bermuda and, and bring that history and in so doing, rewrite history that all of our people benefit. Because unless we're telling the real history of all of our people, history is not, not being taught. It's some biased version or someone's perspective. And uh, we believe that we must celebrate all of our people. And it is our job to make certain that our people understand the role that we, fully as Blacks, played making Bermuda what it is today and that we did indeed play a big role and an important role. And it, it, it is our duty every step of the way to uncover every single kernel that will correct the history that has been taught and, and put in place history that is a true depiction of people and so I want to thank the Rashidas and the Aj the Ajalas and others um Leonie Jones uh Dr. McFadden uh Dr. Clarence Maxwell Jr. um Keto Swan all of these people in some way have been trying to share with Bermuda pieces of history that can raise our and uh, if you will, 
pieces of history that are and told and proud for all of the accomplishments that we have been responsible for in shaping the Bermuda that we see today. And I, and I just want to say that I am happy that we all are here sharing together uh, on the eve of Emancipation Day and our inaugural Mary Prince Day to say that we have made one more major step because it will impact and is impacting the, the psychology of our young people in a very positive way. And that is extremely important. And I, and I can speak firsthand of many of the young people that I've been speaking with of late. And I'm talking about the 10 and nine year olds who can speak in depth, some of them, about the Mary Princess, who speak with pride as they should and speak with pride of other women and who are, are heroes in their eyes. And you can see the positive impact. It, 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 it's a source of inspiration and motivation. And with that type of foundation, it encourages and feeds the belief they can be all that they wish to be and they can rise up and, and, and in a community that belongs to them that they that they are um of a loin that is responsible for making bermuda the great bermuda that it is today and will be responsible for making it a thousand times better tomorrow all right thank you minister thank you for all the all the work that you and your ministry and all those who have been a part of this have been. Because often, far too often, we have a, anyone can be a government, right? But not everybody is willing to tell the truth about our, our history. So in that, now we we'll move on to Ms. Rashida Godwin, who uh, through herself and her husband, Mr. Godwin, they are in Titan Express. So, and what I find about Titan Express is that they aren't just a transportation company. They're a sort of a transportation company. To happen. They're, they're, a his, they're a history company that happens to have transportation involved. So with that, Ms. Rashida Godwin, can you tell us what is Titan Express, um, their mission to highlight the life of Mary Prince and the tours that you all do? Yeah, so um, Titan Express, we're a transportation and tour company. Um, I prefer to actually call myself, not a historian, but um, one person told me that I need to call myself a memory recovery specialist. <laughs> and I like that part. <laughs> um, because it's important to just, the members are already in us. We're already of African descent. The members are already there. We just need to recover them. And it's people that have been missing, which, which they used to call the griots, that used to send, um, tell the stories within the African community. Um, and that's how the stories used to get passed on. And so that's what someone had told me. And um, the older person when I was on the tour, they said that. And I just really um, liked that one time. Because I didn't really like the name of a historian, because I just didn't feel like that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm actually trying to get these stories out because people have lived this life right here in Bermuda and we're descendants of them and we're all descendants of the country. And um, these stories need to be told. We need to understand that they didn't, are, the people that came here uh, on these enslaved ships, they lived a very horrible, horrid life right here on this island. And it wasn't, it was not, I can't even say it wasn't easy for them. It was horrible for them. It was absolutely atrocious on how they were treated and how they were lived, how they had to live. And Mary Prince, her story has to be told. Her story is the core of the emancipation. Um, her story is very important for us today. Like I said, it's the timeline. And, um, so we did the Mary Prince tour. Ajala explained uh, all about Mary Prince. Um, it's not much I, I could really explain about her, but she lived right here in Bermuda. Um, she was Bermudian. 
And then we would take you on the bus tour and just share with you um, parts of where she lived right here in Bermuda and her story. And at the same time, we share parts of her enslaved narrative that um, she experienced at this various locations. And so now we also had the addition of the park, which is great. So we're definitely gonna um, include that in the tour as well going forward as best that we can. Um, but for now, the tour is just over an hour and um, I could take, we could take groups on the bus and it could be conducted by myself or Ajala. And so what, what is the reaction when you are taking people, rather, rather Bermudians or visitors around to these historic, historic sites and, and you're telling them the truth about what really happened? Um, both, both sides, it, and they see, <laughs> Ajala, I'm gonna tell a funny story. Remember one time you got on the bus and everybody on the bus did not look like us? I just say that. And he, got, he got back off of the bus and he said, Rashida, do they know that what tour they're going on? And I said, yeah, absolutely. I said, they're excited about it. We have people from England, we had British people, we have people from the US and they were, they were all, they didn't look like us. I just say that. <laughs> <laughs> the Jala thought they were on the wrong tour. <laughs> 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 and they love these stories of Bermuda and these stories we have to bring up. <laughs> <laughs> mm. yeah. yeah. So when when Sorry to oh, in particular to for black Bermudians or young Bermudians. I'm sorry, say that again. I think, Minister, you were trying to say something as well just now. I said that the story that you tell and the families that come and participate in your tours, they hunger for those stories because just like they want to know the unadulterated truth about our history, they do. And I, I can say that community and culture have had such people write in, and uh, and I'm sure you have as well. When they went on your um, tours, they had had people write us and speak to those tours and say, say how well, how truly educational they were, and that they are happy to hear about the actual and true history and not some war down version of what typically gets told so keep telling the story that you tell it because we need to hear it yeah absolutely thank thank you minister so rashida when you as you when when most of us came up in um primary school we were taken around to the aquarium maritime museum City Hall, we, we never were taken around to see about our black people. And we we didn't know about Mary Prince. So when you when you have young people on your tour, what is your reaction when 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 you're telling them or or Jala is telling them the story? Story. It's quite fascinating. I could what, share what you see on their face. It is absolutely. It was, for instance, AK, I'll tell my the last group I took out last week, I took out a summer camp. Um, a summer camp instructor, um, she contacted me um, and she said, said, you know, I know you do these um, history tours, black history tours. I have my children are between um, eight to 12 years old. Um, I just, I would love for them to be able to do your tours, to be able to do it and make it children appropriate. And I said, yeah, fascinating. Yes, we can. He took the children out. I called it because we're in emancipation. I called it a freedom tour. I said, we're going to do a freedom tour, guys. We I gave them activity sheets to do. We also did trivia. And so I gave them out the prize, little prizes that were candy. And so, yeah, we did Mary Prince and we did Sally Bassett. We did Boss Bay Park and we did the um, When Voices Rise Up at City Hall. So I just tapped it to about an hour with them and they were excited. They even called me the next day because every time we visited a site, we got off of the bus. For instance, we went to Boss Bay Park and I gave the children a list of the 78 enslaved people that were actually on the ship. 
And from eight to 12 years old, I, I was questioning them. I said, guys, look at, look at the ages. And they were like, this is my age. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, this is me. This is I said, absolutely, guys. And remember, they didn't have freedom. We have freedom. So that was the continued narrative throughout. And for them to understand freedom. And um, so that is to bring the stories out for them. And the children loved it. The um, camp instructor, she said this was just phenomenal for her. And to just even take the children out like that. And she believes that her students actually got something out of it. And even this year, we worked with Cedar Bridge and a few other schools. And most of the times, the children are very, very receptive. I don't hardly have any children who said that they've been bored or anything. Most times it's like, please don't take me back to that prison. That's what they say to me. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, uh, first thing in the morning, they're right, supposed um, to have um, permission slips to get on the bus before I leave. And some of them are begging me to, please don't leave me here at the school, Miss God, but call my mama, I need to get on this bus with you, please. And, and, and the, the children are very, very receptive, very. All right, so we'll go back to Brother Jala. Brother Jala, and now, in, now that we have a minister and a minister that is committed to telling the whole truth, in your opinion, in five minutes or less, what more truths need to come out about Black Bermudian history or Bermudian history on the whole? Well, I think we need to tie um, very explicitly um, Bermuda and Africans in Bermuda to Africans on the continent and Africans in the uh, Caribbean basin, the Atlantic basin, and be much more uh, systematic about the ways that we make those connections and make those connections visible in the classroom. So it is a great thing, let me just say this at the outset, it's a great thing that we are retelling the story of Mary Prince because there's an African proverb which simply states, only when lions have historians will hunters cease being heroes, right? And as I had said in my opening remarks, um, too many people who claim to be historians have been grievously misrepresenting the story of Africans here in Bermuda. So part of our task is to rewrite the propaganda and actually express the unadulterated truth of our ancestors' um, sojourn here in Bermuda. But in addition to that, we have to make um, very deliberate connections between we, the Africans on this landmass, with those in Barbados, in Jamaica, in Antigua, in Haiti, as well as those in West and Central Africa, because we are fruit from those trees. And we are still the same people. Just because a cat has kittens in an oven doesn't make them biscuits. Malcolm X said that many years ago. It still uh, holds true today. We are Africans in Bermuda and our, our kin are in St. Kitts, our kin are in Barbados and so on and so forth. Our kin are in uh, from Yoruba land in West Africa, right? Or, or <clears throat> excuse me, or the, uh, what is another people who came directly? The Gullah Geechee people, uh, many of whom were um, counted amongst the 78 enslaved captives um, when uh, the enterprise vessel limped into Bars Bay Park on February 11th, 1835. So we have all of these connections, right, between Africans worldwide. And I think we have to do a, we have to make a more consistent effort in making those connections so that our children here who are African, born and raised in Bermuda, see themselves not as some, um, some people living on this isolated rock in the middle of the Atlantic, but they see themselves rather as connected to a larger African family whose roots run so deep, run all the way back to the beginning of humankind itself, right? So it's important that we make those connections so that we can see ourselves as having access to the entirety of African history, of which we are a small and incredibly important part. Uh, on that note, um, historian and author Cyril Packwood wrote a piece um, and was published in the Bermudian magazine recently. And it spoke of the fact that the majority of those who came here enslaved came via the West Indies, not necessarily directly from Africa, 
The point I'm trying to get at is that for for centuries, black people have been told, oh, you're different from those people down in the Caribbean or those people are less than us. And all this propaganda basically to instill in black comedians that you don't want to associate with, with your brother, your brothers and sisters in the Caribbean. And interestingly, the theme for this year's um, Heritage Month was our Caribbean connections. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Minister. Celebrating our Caribbean connections. That, Celebrating our Caribbean connections. Right. So, right. so we all know what happened. We had COVID, so everything got kind of uh, pushed to the side. But the, the point I'm going to get at, which draws, which ties into your point, um, Ajala, is that we have been brainwashed. We collectively have been brainwashed to think comedians just popped up on this rock out of the volcano and we came from nowhere else. We didn't come from Africa. We didn't come from any Caribbean, other Caribbean island where that's total hogwash, right? There, there were Africans who came here prior to uh, emancipation, abolishment, abolition, and then there's Africans who came here after, but 90% came through the West Indies, rather states where the majority came from, Jamaica, Barbados, you have white, you have white comedians where so the, the people came from Sabre. So these, these are things that a progressive government does to actually tell the truth to the people of the island because for too long, the narrative has been, as you said, told by those who seek to oppress us. So I'm glad that yeah, I'm, I'm personally, as a Bermudian, glad to see the minister interact with private entities such as uh, the press um, to help bring the full story of who we are as Bermudians. And um, yourself, Ajala, you need, you know, as, as your book comes out, that needs to be put in every school. It has to be. Else our children are, are again going to be subjected to what someone else writes. So, I personally just want to take a moment to thank all three of you for what you're doing for the doing for the people of Bermuda, all, all people of Bermuda and all visitors of Bermuda. Um, we're going to wrap up in a few. So, um, Minister, any final comments? Thank people like you, Chris. Yes, Chris, I want to thank people like you who dare to allow your voice to be heard because you were one of the lead people, you and persons like Ralph Mission and quite a few other Bermudians were one of the lead people out there pushing, for instance, for a Mary Prince Day. And I want to tell you that in the Ministry of Community Affairs and Sports, we are doing everything within our power to ensure we help our Bermudians understand and people and others here to understand what it is to Bermudian, to understand that we as a people, we have a history, we have a past, we have a culture. And our job is to make certain that all of that shared and understood, but not shared according to some sense you know, um, sensitized version, sh shared as it was. And I can tell you that we have a lineup of other things we're doing with Dr. Simmons. We're making sure we tell the story of um, Corbin. And I'm sure that some of you have heard of the goodwill games with respect to golf. And yet it was a Bermudian like Corbin way back when, who was key in showing that that got to play on the biggest stage in golf. Yet, once again, a completely different story has been told, but it's not the truth. And our job is to make certain that our people learn about every facet of this society that we're key in shaping. And that when our history is denied, we are going to make certain that our people get the truth. And I can tell you that we also sponsored um, with the Portuguese community, Milton Raposo did 
um, did a film feature on the history of the Portuguese people and, and how they have come to form an integral part of this society. And um, that was a, a, another lesson from me for me. And um, there are parts of their history that we don't know. And you and the Portuguese community came out to hear about the history and, and some of the key roles that they have played in shaping Bermuda. But and so as you ended up uh, this year's theme celebrating our Caribbean connections. Much work has been done in a whole lot of other areas. And we recognized here in community and cultural affairs that there hasn't been, even though we have a deep Caribbean connection, there has not been much done to actually explore that and celebrate that in a different way so people truly appreciate what while we have troops like the gum base. People truly appreciate what where where we come from. And culture we share is shared in a different geographical area, but nonetheless it unites us as a people. And that it is important to understand what that is. And so um, the intention is to be couldn't celebrate it this year to keep that theme in place and next year um, during heritage month it will be all about celebrating um, the Caribbean connections and, and and it will be all about celebrating what it is to be Bermudian because that's the other thing that was especially um, part of um, the whole theme for this year it was to celebrate being Bermudian and and part of that came from hearing so much in the public domain people say well what is it to be Bermudian and uh, they're not really Bermudian anyway well I I choose to be Bermudian and you uh, just from you we've seen comments like that and others and so we thought you know what that we teach everyone about what it is to be Bermudian. Part of that is digging deep into our history and all of our culture with ourselves and with others who reside here in Bermuda and with the rest of the world. And so people won't have to wonder anymore. And we will continue that in every way we can. And all I want to say is happy Emancipation Day tomorrow. Happy Merry Prince Day. And happy Cup Match Holiday. And um, I hope that we're all thinking about what the history and the purpose of this big celebration is. Because this, this year is a true commemoration of the history and purpose behind Cup Match. And thank you for inviting me to be on your show this evening. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. And who's your team again? <laughs> hey, St. George. Um, I didn't hear it. Miss <laughs> Godwin, anything you'd like to say as we wrap up? Um. Yes, um, I would just like to say again, of course, happy Emancipation Day to everybody and Merry Prince Day as we celebrate these next two days. And I just hope that as Bermudians celebrate these next uh, few days of this holiday, that they will reflect on the past and that they may even decide, you could even Google Mary Prince, you could and get her book and read it and for them to help to understand how we came to have this holiday. Yes. I love the team and the games and all those things very much. I have a big family. We do cup match big every year. But at the end of it all, we have to understand how did we get her? Why are we her? And how do we want to move forward? So in order to do that, we have to know Mary Prince's story. We have to understand it. And I don't want people, sometimes you hear people, they really think that something was taken from them. Nothing was taken. We're just trying to make history, no, we're not even trying. We have made history correct. We've corrected it. And us as black people, we um, have to do that unapologetically. 
Um, with no apologies to anybody. It's Mary Prince Day. It deserves to be Mary Prince Day. And that's what the holiday is. And so I just ask that people just reflect on the history of the holiday and that they would research further with the families. And I just pray that everyone is safe and that they enjoy the holiday. And just quickly, if they want to do a Mary Prince tour and know more about her story, it's just a short tour, it's just over an hour. Um, they could contact us at um, info at titantoursbermuda.com. All right, thank you. Brother Ajale, Ajala, how would you like to close out? Uh, I guess in a minute or less. Um, history is contested ground as I began at the outset. And one of the things that history allows us to do is to ask some troubling questions. Like for example, how is it that both uh, Sir Henry Tucker and Paulo Kumar Cafego sworn enemies during their lives? How is it in what world is it possible for both of these gentlemen to be ethno heroes? What sorts of conversations, what sorts of contortions must have uh, uh, been taking place in order for both of those gentlemen to occupy the same space as heroes here in Bermuda at the same time? Right? How is it that um, Sir Edward Trenton Richards, Richards can be selected as a hero? Now, there's many questions, troubling and unsettling questions that come out of a a comprehensive um, excavation of the story of this little island. So another one, uh, speaking about the Portuguese, how is it that the enduring myth of the hard working Portuguese, how, how, did, how did they come to monopolize agriculture and construction? How'd that happen? So again, questions. And perhaps uh, are they occupying, were they brought in to occupy a buffer zone between Anglo whites and the black Romanian working class? Let's have those conversations. In order to have those conversations, you have to excavate the ground that is the historical record of the past two to 300 years. And so it takes courage and the willingness to unsettle and in some cases, anger and outrage those who have become far too comfortable squatting upon the uh, wreckage of a story poorly told and deliberately poorly told at that. So as, as, a, as a chronicler of the story of African people in Bermuda and around the world, it is my moral obligation to unsettle the narrative so that the truth can rise to the top and so that we can all partake of its, of its uh, comprehensive examination. Thank you. So in thing, I want to thank all three of you for being here. More important, I want to thank Bernie's for hosting this, and I want to thank the hundreds of persons who have been tuning in. Um, as Ajala says, as the minister says, and as uh, Miss Somerset says, um, <laughs> we have a lot of truth to tell, and you know, we we ask people to to examine that if someone was enslaving you, someone was beating you was raping you, someone was murdering you, are they going to admit to that in their books? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. And we are going to use this medium, we are going to use other to continue to tell the truth, tell our truths. And um, in closing, I just want to um, wish everyone a safe Emancipation Day, a safe Merry Prince Day, and a safe holiday. And one last thing, Everybody who's for St. George's, put up your hand.